fun. So it says, what made us unique? And then it goes into divine DNA. We're into part two of a several part series. I don't know what it's going to end. Before Christmas for sure. We'll end it before Christmas because we have to talk about Christmas. So probably early December we'll be finishing up. Um, and we're getting into all things DNA. Uh, I said last week in part one that uh, if you didn't know, you probably know this, but maybe if you didn't, that you have divine DNA on the inside of you. You have the DNA of God. I don't remember what it was called, dionucleoribionic acid or something. I didn't, I was not near as good in practice this week as last week. I just reverted to calling it DNA now. But what makes you unique in the DNA inside of you also makes this church unique because you're here, I'm guessing, because you like something that's going on or you believe God's called you here. So your DNA, your unique DNA placed here makes City Center unique and our DNA. And I believe that every church has God's unique imprint or design instituted into it, which is constitutes of you, but makes us what we do, who we are, why we're unique, why we're different. Um, why there's graffiti on the wall, why it's an old warehouse, different things like that, that all forms a part of it. And it's a genetic code that shapes us, creates us, makes us look like the way we do. And so we're unraveling that a little bit so that as we grow and as God takes us places, we all on the same page. I used the illustration last week about how we're the body of Christ. And if somebody comes in and they're a hand in the body of Christ and there's a foot and there's an ear and was it a butt cheek? Did I do that? I'm back to the butt cheeks. I have kids, so, right? Butt cheeks. All right. And so if nobody knows exactly which way we're going, then you get everyone trying to go in different directions, and when everyone's pulling, when one body's trying to go four different directions, that's really awkward and uh, probably not what you want to represent when somebody comes in. They see everyone kind of looking like that. They go, okay, what's going on here? So last week we talked about vision. Scripture says, where there's not a write the vision, make it plain. Where there's not a vision, people perish or they cast off restraint. I talked about how if you find yourself doing some things and behaving in ways you don't want to, um, get some vision in your life. Put some purpose. Write something down as goals because that tends to uh, restrain you and, and put some parameters in your life. How many of you know that? When you have nothing to live for or nothing to go after, then you think, hey, I can just cast off restraint. Anything goes. But how many of you know if you have a goal of something, like let's say being, being a, in, in the police force, right? Even when you're 17, 18, 19, 20, if you really have that goal, you're like maybe out with some friends and doing some stuff and you're like, maybe I shouldn't be doing this because I want to do this later on. If I do this, that might put this in jeopardy. So vision helps restrain and puts everyone in purpose, does that and, and helps define you and keeps you in line sometimes. So we talked about the vision last week. Does anyone remember, don't put it up, does anyone remember the vision? I mean, some people have notes. Does anyone actually remember some of it, any part, a line of it? See if I remember it. We're going to put it up on the wall and so you'll be able to look at it, but it's good to get this inside of you. The vision of City Center Church that I believe is God designed, it's divine, it helps us make what we are supposed to be and who we're supposed to be. Anyone remember anything who didn't look at notes? Then I'll go to notes. Okay, so that's good. To, to have a beyond the walls church. Okay, does anyone remember kind of the next thing? Excellence, right? So that develops excellence of spirit, capital S, and us flowing in the spirit, but the Holy Spirit in this place. If you wondered why praise and worship kind of goes a little longer of late and we kind of sat there and, 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 and flowed, that's trying to have excellence of spirit, allowing God to move that we don't just come in and say, here's the timeline, and we go through it, and then we hope God kind of fits in there, and we say, God, here it is if you want to show up, but no, that we're allowed to say, hey, there's some space in here for the spirit of God to move and intervene. So that's excellence, developing excellence of spirit. Who remembers the other two S's? Structure and strategy, right? So God leads. He gives us a structure. He gave Noah an ark. Right, and he gave him all a bunch of details about the ark and how to build it, and Noah wasn't just winging it every day. A hundred years before Noah finished, God gave him an instruction of how to do it. And then for a hundred years, he had to faithfully walk that out. Right, so there was a structure, and then at the end, he gave him the strategy after it was done. He said, well, it wasn't hard for him. It was like, I'm going to bring him in two by two. There was a, a strategy of how that was going to happen. That was God to, uh, instituted and, and done, but there was a strategy. And so we're in that, I was saying, you know, 
there is the spirit leading, we get a structure, and then a lot of times strategies will change. How many of you know it's okay to change a strategy? We don't want to confuse strategies with structures or the spirit because the spirit guides them, but we should be quick to change strategies, less quick to change structures, and no, never quick to change what the Holy Spirit wants. But we sometimes get confused and we're like, why are we doing this again? We're changing this. No, that's just a strategy. And we're trying to get the heart of God to do it the best way. And so that was kind of last week's the missions. Oh yeah, to have a ball in the walls church that develops excellence of spirit, structure, and strategy to what's the desire of this? Why are we doing all this? To what? To help people encounter Jesus. If you forget everything about the mission statement or the vision statement, you need to remember this. That has sat with me. How many of you that question, remember we asked five questions. Uh, The five questions last week were, um, do we see people as God sees them? Do we treat people as Jesus would treat them? Do we see ourselves as God sees us? Do we treat ourselves as God treats us, and, or to treat ourselves as Jesus treats us? And then this last question has sat with me, and I cannot leave it alone. And I think if any church, our church, if everyone in here just landed this question and implemented it into their life, it would change everything. And it's this question, do I look like I've been with Jesus? That is, like, think of doing this as I'm about to go speak or as I'm about to say something or I'm about to do my taxes or I'm about to do, you know, and I'm about to do this. If I asked while I'm doing something, does this look like I've been with Jesus? Can you imagine how our interactions would change with the people around us? Could you imagine those thoughts that we have? Does this think, like, does this thought look like or am I thinking like I've been with Jesus? Am I acting like I've been with Jesus? Do you imagine how many relationships between husband and wives would actually still be together if both of them took that approach? Am I, is this, am I saying wrong stuff? Everyone's like staring at me like this is, I don't know. Can I get a witness? Listen, I just came from a conference in, in Edmonton that was a charismatic conference. <laughs> And there was a lot of feedback. What was the one thing the minister said? The guy gets up and he goes, if you like something, you say, roll that back. So he says it again. So I was like, I want to institute that. Roll that back. But it was very interesting. Now this is just like, so anyways, come on, just say, roll that back. There we go. That means you're listening. So the idea that can you imagine in every relationship or everything you did, you couldn't even gossip You couldn't, like if you're about to say something about someone and you think, does this, what I'm about to say look like or sound like I've been with Jesus? Come on. All right, I gotta get off that. That, Take that question, keep it, put it up somewhere. Maybe we should get it up here because I think that question changes everything. And it's very simple. Does this thing look like I've been with Jesus? I can't preach on the review. So we're gonna jump into part two here. And so we did the vision to have a Beyond the Walls church, let me just finish it, that develops excellence of spirit, structure, and strategy. You can put it up now, Alana. To help people encounter Jesus and... Now, if, even if you weren't here, you can read it at the end. And... See themselves as God sees them. And that was a challenge for us at the end, too, saying, do we see people as God sees them? Oftentimes, we see people as their difficulty, as their struggle, as their addiction, as their frustration to us. We see them from that, something in the natural, how they look. And God doesn't, we see, you learned it was with David when he anointed him king. You see that he says, all his brothers came and they were all good looking and strong and tall and everything and looked like they should be ruling. And God said, no, 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 no. And he gets to David. I don't know what he looked like. Maybe he was just younger. Maybe, I don't know. But he says this, that man looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. So do we see people as God sees them, created, uniquely made, royal priesthood, holy nation, set apart, designed in the image of God? Look at somebody beside you and say, you were made in God's image. Right. That's so important to never forget. All right, we're going to jump into part two here. Who here has ever set a goal for themselves? Who is like a goal-setting I know Dennis and Verona, I think they have a mission statement or a vision for their marriage, right? I think we did a class and you talked about that. But who's ever set a goal for themselves? You say, yeah, I got this. You got a picture of what you'd like in your life for some things you want to do. Who's ever done a New Year's resolution? That's a goal. Anyone that 
Who succeeded on a New Year's resolution? One, two, three, four, five, six people. Good. Well done. They really work, don't they? So we can have a New Year's resolution. Who's ever set a goal to lose some weight? Who's ever set a goal to gain some weight? Yeah, when I was young too, right? It's like, I want to bulk up, lose some weight. I won't ask you to see if you've actually lost the weight because you can tell I haven't, so uh, we're still working on that. But we set a goal to lose some weight. It's something in six months, I'm going to be like this. In two months, I'm going to have this. When I'm this year old, I'll have millions of dollars. And we set goals, and those are good. But when you do those things, or a New Year's resolution, or a goal, or a vision, you can realize that they can be hard to attain. In sports, certain sports have goals as a, as a thing that you achieve. If you're playing hockey, you want to score a goal. Play soccer, you want to score a goal. Other sports have different things. In baseball, it's runs. You want to get a run. Um, basketball, you get basket score. I guess you kind of score points, right? So there's different things. In you know, combat sports, you want to get a takedown, right? So there's this idea of goal or score or points, and only those who practice the most, prepare the most, put the, the work in the most, actually end up being the ones that score the most or achieve the goals. It doesn't just come naturally. Everyone that, there's a lot of people that want to get in these sports and make it to the NHL and the NFL and get touchdowns and everything, but they don't. And even the ones that make it, there's only certain ones that get the goals, get to their goals. So getting to a goal can be really challenging. How many of you know that? Achieving a goal, setting them is easy sometimes. Yeah, I got to do this, I want to do this. But getting and achieving them could be way more difficult. So we could talk about the vision at City Center Church. We had a great service last week. Patrick loved it, right, Patrick? he's entrepreneurial so vision setting and all that he gets really juiced up on that so we could have a service and everyone kind of go that's amazing but if we don't actually take that goal and say this is how we're going to achieve it one day we'll be looking back and go remember that time when Pastor Derek got up on the stage he talked about vision and then we put something up on the wall it wasn't that nice that was really cool we didn't do a lot with that but that was you know that was fun and we got all excited and Patrick was really pumped, and that was everything, right? That was it. And so we don't want that to happen. So in order, when you have a goal or vision, you want to actually put a plan together or a way to do that. And in this case, we usually often call that in the business industry or this kind of thing, a mission or a mission statement. So we had a vision, and now you have a mission statement is this is how we're going to achieve what we believe God wants us to do, and this is how it can be worked out. And so we've had our mission statement for a while. Our vision's newer, kind of the overarching thing. But this mission statement's been around for a while. Um, I added a little bit into it, but not much. But a mission is this, an important assignment carried out for a specific purpose. Do you know that City Center Church, that you guys have an important assignment for a specific purpose? Well, if you don't believe that, then why are we here? We have an important assignment. Come on, how many of you know at this church, City Center Church, placed in the middle of 20th Street between G&H, God's heart, G&H, God's heart, G for, no, okay, you got it, you got it, right? Just making sure we're alert, coffee's kicking in now, some of you, I can see everything's firing, starting to fire, the light's turning on behind, you know, in the eyes, oh, coffee, right? But we've been placed here for a specific purpose with a specific assignment. I said, you can go to different churches around here and they look different, but our purpose is to be plugged right in the inner city of Saskatoon and to impact it with Jesus and the love of God, come on. Man, I, just, I think I'm in the wrong place. I'm going to tell myself, run that back, Pastor Derek. We have been placed here. You have been placed here. You're not here just to come and sit on a Sunday morning and see what's Derek going to say, how much is he going to sway and walk around, how fast is he going to talk, you know, what's happening. You've been placed here for a specific purpose. Hopefully you come in, you get energized, you get the word, and then you go, okay, now I'm going to go out and do my assignment. But not only that, we have things that God has us doing down here that we impact the immediate community in our neighborhood around us. That is for a design purpose. We have been placed. Come on. On. This is a prime location in the inner city of Saskatoon. We've had to fight for this building. People wanted this, and we prayed about it. We said, no, no, God, you've placed us here for a specific purpose, a church here that's going after God, that wants to show the love of God. You've put us here, and we're staying here until you come to glory, or we go to glory and you come. I don't know if we're staying here that long. I haven't prayed that far into it, but that's where I am right now until he tells us to move.
Guys, stop listening so well because I'm not going to get through this. An important assignment carried out for a specific purpose, a special task with a person or a group is charged, a special task with which we've been charged, a divine task with which we've been charged, ascending out or being sent out with authority to perform a special service. service. I am a little sleep deprived today, so there could be some words that don't form right. Like I said, I came back from a conference from Edmonton, got back later yesterday, yesterday evening, and then got woken up at 4.15, 4.30 in the morning. I don't know why. Just started praying and stuff. I usually get up pretty close to then, but that was still early, so. But hallelujah. We've been given a divine important assignment. We've been charged with a specific unique assignment. We are a specific unique church here in the inner city of Saskatoon. It's been entrusted to us for a specific unique purpose. And now we've been entrusted by God and given authority to carry out this vision. CC Church is on a mission to carry out our divine vision. So here's the mission. CC Church's mission is this, building lives together in Christ through compassion, connection, and community resulting in neighborhood transformation. So the vision is to have a beyond the walls church that develops spirit structure and strategy that helps people encounter Jesus and help or helps people to encounter Jesus and see themselves as God sees them. This is the way we do that by building lives together in Christ through compassion, connection, and community that results in neighborhood transformation. So there's the how we're going to do this. And then over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about our values or what it looks like and that, what we should value that helps us reach the vision and mission. This will probably be, I don't know if I'll ever do this again, it'll be probably several years before I do this again, or if I do, because this is going to go on our digital stuff and our website, and so we'll have it. But I believe we're in a strategic time, I told you this, where growth is coming, and so if we are able to get on the same page, it'll allow us to do this better. You'll see later that we're going to talk about community and, and things like that, so you'll see how, why, why this is important. So building lives together, that's the word I added, if you're familiar with our mission statement from several years ago, building lives together in Christ through compassion, connection, community, resulting in neighborhood transformation. If you want a tagline for the church, what is the church all about? Building lives, transforming neighborhoods. That's even simpler. And if you want to go even simpler, building and transforming, building and transforming, building and transforming, building, transforming, building lives, transforming neighborhoods, building lives in Christ through compassion, together through compassion, connection, community, resulting in neighborhood transformation. So we're going to do what we did last week. I know this is a little more teaching. There's some preaching in here. I'll get excited about some areas and preach on it, and then we'll go back to teaching. But we're going to just run through this. These words are, I believe, God-led. Um, I didn't have an open vision, right? Everything exactly how God, or we didn't, because this was formed before. But we didn't have open visions, but we talked about it and went, what words fit, and this is what we want to do. So we're going to w- walk through this and show you why we picked this. So the first word there is Building. Building. Who here likes to build things? I'm looking for one person. Yes, right there, Matt. I'm hoping you're still putting up your hand there. You're doing a lot of building. Who likes to build things? Who has ever built Lego? Right? Like Lego is amazing building Lego. Who remembers Lego from back in the day when all you had was like a few colors, those little green, you know, foundation pieces, and you built on them, and like if I remember if I built a house and I put a window in it, I was pretty excited. <laughs> like, oh, I built the house. I don't know. People were probably more creative. But it was just a bunch of pieces in a bin, and you dump them out and try to build something. That's how Lego was built before, right? Does anyone know before that? Like, is there a before that Lego? Like, when it was made out of trees and stuff? I don't know. <laughs> Anybody? No? Okay. <laughs> You're whittling out pieces from trees. Got your axe. I don't know how far back Lego goes, but that's what Lego, Lego now is way different. Lego has a vision and a mission. They put a picture in front of you, a goal, a vision, and you get your kids walking by the store seeing and say, I want that. They set a vision before everybody, and they say, I want that. They put it, and everyone gets excited. And man, Lego's never going to go to business because they just shift to the latest movie, the latest thing, the latest, and then they make it, and everybody wants it. It's a brilliant idea. Lego, if you're listening, I'd like to buy in because I, I think you guys are brilliant. I only have 100 bucks though, so I don't know what you can do with that. 
But if we get an opportunity, City Center Church is going to invest in Lego. I just see it's never going to die. But they have a vision, and then you open it up, and they have a mission. Like, they lay out everything on how this is how you can do this. And so you go to building it, if you've ever done that, and probably, or if you've seen your kids, and then they have package one, package two, package three, the bigger, the more packages, and it's exciting, and then you open the book, and it's like, do this little bit, and then you do this, and oftentimes it's kind of like, do this, then do this next section, and do this next section, and then and as you're doing it, you sort of have to make it come together. Sometimes you keep building, but it's often some parts, and then you see it come together, and you're like, there it is, and it's great. But I've seen uh, my kids doing it, sometimes they'll come up to me and be like, hey, what happened here? I don't know what's going on. And what's happened is they're about three packages in and they realize when they're trying to put some pieces together that the original structure that they made for it or the foundation, they got something messed up. And they're like, but I can't do it now. This piece was backwards. They didn't see something, so it's quite backwards, so it doesn't all go back together. I wanted to make this point. Sometimes when we talk about building, we just think building, building, building. But if the structure or the foundation has a flaw, sometimes in building, you have to break down or tear down before you actually build up. So when we say building, I want you to understand that doesn't mean that there's not some things that need to break down. Look at somebody and say, break it down. Look at, me, Pastor, look at me and say, break it down, Pastor Derek. Yeah. No, I'm not going to dance, no. I asked Patrick, wow, I'm talking about you a lot today, Patrick. We were over there, I was like, Patrick, I need some help with my dance moves because I see him over there praising. <laughs> it's slow, but it's got so much in it. Mmm, mmm, yeah, yeah. And then I'm just like trying to get it. And he generates way more, he generates way more with this and, uh, than, you know, everything we, anyways. Yes, I agree. The young child's like, yeah, I can see that. But building, right, we might have to break it down a little bit or tear something down. Because if you try to build on a foundation that doesn't have the right pieces, the more you build on it, the greater the chance it's not going to work. I watched Lego Masters. Anyone watch Lego Masters? I have kids, so that's why. It's not for me at all. I live vicariously through them wishing I grew up in the age of Lego. But I told my son, when he gets older, we're going to buy one of them big Legos and we're going to do it together because that seems exciting. But I was watching Lego Masters and what they were doing is they were building houses for cats. Like a cat house. And so they were doing it and there was this one team that was building like three distinct parts. And then they have like 12 hours and their time goes down. And in the last like hour, 30 minutes, they, were try they went to put their parts together and realized they never made anything to attach the structures together. Yeah, I think, I think they were eliminated, I don't know. <laughs> like, and so they went and they were like, everyone, the cats are going in and everyone's like, amazing, and they're playing and they got them, I don't know, they put food in there to get the cats to play in the structure and they're going up and down stairs and it's like, this is wonderful. And then they bring theirs and the guy's like, sorry, we don't even think this is safe to let a cat in. <laughs> so they can go in this one part, but those other two parts that you build up, because what happened is they got to it and realized, we don't have a firm foundation to build this on and if something goes in, it's just gonna collapse. So they didn't have time. They could have torn some stuff down and tried to do that, but they didn't have time to do that. So when we're talking about foundation, if the foundation is flawed, you might have to break down before you build up. I just wanted everyone to know that. So inherent in that is that idea, like if you've got some things in your life, when you come to Christ and then the journey after that, there are going to be some things in your life that probably won't be good or some foundational things or things you think are foundational that you're going to say, I need to adjust that. I need to get rid of this. I need to break that down. I need to tear that out before you start building up. I'm going to say that again. If you're newer in Christ or maybe you've been there here for a while and you're trying to build and you're going, why does it seem like things keep breaking down, things keep failing, stuff's not working? It might be because you might need to tear some things out of your life. You might need to break some things down so that your foundation can get firm so you can start building on it properly. We hold on to too many things from the past that we try to make a part of our foundation and when we try to build on it, it ends up making us crumble a little bit in some areas. And so we have to be willing in building to go, maybe I need to take this down. That was for free too. 11.56, who put the time ahead 30 minutes? I knew it was you, Bob. He's like, he didn't know I'd see him. So building, 
Christ is my firm foundation. Should have sang that song today. I missed it. All right, how do we build on a solid foundation quickly here? Uh, I don't know if it's gonna be quickly. I got a lunch date with Pastor Jim and Kathy and Dave McGrew at Earl's. There's no way I'm making it on time. He didn't give me a time, he just said as fast as you can get here, but I, I think they're gonna be faster than we are. Math, especially at what I'm doing, going at the rate I am. Stay focused. Stay focused, Pastor Derek. Matthew 7, 24 and Matthew 7, 26. Uh, 24 is going to come and then 26, and they're kind of two pictures of something going on here about a solid foundation. Matthew 7, 24 in the New King James says this. Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them. Look at somebody and say, and does them. I will liken him to a wise man, awesome, who built his house on the rock. Now put number 26 up, 726. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, look at somebody and say, he didn't do them. Look at somebody else and say, she didn't do them. Equality, I had to make sure it was like, it wasn't the guy or girl not doing the sayings. And does not do them, we will like, uh, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So we're talking about solid foundations. How many of you know when you're building, you know, the chief cornerstone, the, the main rock, they even talk about Jesus being that where every other piece is built upon. You probably want something that's solid like a rock and not loose like a sand to build your foundation on. And it has two things here that are important when talking about what builds a foundation. What makes it solid or what makes it soft? What makes you wise or what makes you a fool? Is these two things hearing and doing. See, we love the part about hearing. Everyone today is in church, or if you're watching on, or watching later, you guys are all going to get this first part right. Good job. It is a really good job, because if you don't hear anything, you have nothing to do from what you heard. Faith comes by hearing. So you need to hear something. You come in, and you need to hear, but what happens if all you do, all what happens when you come in is hear and don't do Matthew here says this, guess what? He calls you something. He calls you a fool. And not only that, he says you're soft. <laughs> Your foundation is gonna be soft. Unfortunately, I think today church is full of soft fools. <laughs> I already was like, man, I could see someone taking that clip and just it going real bad places fast, right? But church, church, not this church, oh no. We don't have any soft fools. We have solid, wise people in this place. But me, look at what Matthew is saying is the distinguishing feature. Those who hear and it's great that you're hearing today, but you could come to church every Sunday and walk out being a soft fool. Come on. So if you want to build on a solid foundation, this is what James says. He says, if you're hearers of the word and not doers only, you go away, you do that, and you deceive yourself. You come and think, I'm good. I heard a lot today. This is great. And you walk out the door and nothing changes. Guess what? The foundation ain't getting built. Is that what that says? Am I right there? I don't know if some of you are convinced or maybe you're like, oh, that's me. I don't know. So it's great. You need to come to hear the word because if you don't hear the word, you have nothing to act on. But if you just come in here, no, you don't want to do that. You want to be able to come and act on the word. Here's what hearers and doers do. It says this, Matthew 7, 25, hearers and doers. I think I put this in. There we go. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock how did it get the firm foundation because they came in and day after day when somebody instructed them in church or they heard something or they read it in the word and they were challenged or they listened to a podcast or a mentor or somebody said something they weren't just here as they said how do I implement this into my life how do I allow God to start changing me how do I let Jesus on the inside of me come and start adjusting me so that I'm not just a foolish soft here but I want to be a doer so that when the storms of life come I'm not shaken my house doesn't collapse because my foundation in Jesus, because I've been doing the word, I've been growing, I've been learning, is strong. 
Here's hearers only. Go to the next one there. Matthew 7, 27. These are hearers only. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Why? The foundation wasn't there. Why wasn't the foundation there? Probably someone was doing a lot of hearing, but not a lot of doing. See, it's the hearing of the word that makes your foundation, uh, it isn't the hearing of the word that makes your foundation solid, it's the doing of the word. So if things seem to be a little unstable in your life, that's a nice way to say it, it's falling, thing, who's ever said, man, things just seem to be falling apart? That may happen, we have times of that. If it seems unstable in your life, start looking for ways to do the word of God in your life and it will start to stabilize you. Okay, that was building. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Thank you for coming, I know I saw him and I said hi. Thank you for coming, appreciate you. Don't worry, yeah, we weren't, I wasn't bothered by the kids. I know they're going, all my kids are rowdy, but that's good. I don't mind little kids being little kids. Um, that was building. I, I'm going to give you some hope. Everyone isn't that long. Like every word, I'm not going to talk for 10 minutes. We would really be here forever. So the next one is building lives together. First Thessalonians 5.11 says this, Therefore encourage one another to build each other up as you are already doing. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. Talking about building each other up, building lives together. And I thought it was important to say building lives. We're not building moments together. Right? We're not just building Sunday mornings together. There are some people come and they just want to come Sunday morning. But what we want for church and city center church people and people that come, we want them to build their lives together. With us, with here, but also as you'll see as we go forward in Christ, we'll talk about that. So we don't want just moments or Sunday attendance, only select parts of our lives. We'll only let God have this part of my life, or we'll only let people come this close to us because we're guarded and stuff. No, we want people to be able to build lives together, not religious rituals, not just rules, lives. We are about building lives holistically and holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y and H-O-L-Y holistically and wholly, completely building lives together, together, together. Who's ever heard this or maybe you've got a friend or you've married someone and you look at them one day and you say, man, we've really built a good life together. We've really built something together. What that means is that it's that DNA where it starts to intertwine and it forms that ladder and it goes like this and it becomes together where honestly you can't tell one begin, where one begins and the other ends. And so there's certain people you're going to have in your life where that probably happens, especially if you marry them, hopefully. But as we'll see building lives, we're going to talk about building lives in Christ. I think this would be the biggest compliment would be somebody saying, listen, I can't tell where Christ ends and where you begin. And I can't tell where you end and Christ begins because it's so intertwined together that it's just like it's kind of DNA meshing together and it just, it's the same. And so that's the idea of together. We want to build our lives together with each other and in Christ. And so that's the next part. Building lives in Christ. Colossians 1, 27 to 29. I'm going to uh, give you a preview. In two weeks... Pastor Greg Gallen's going to be coming in to minister. Yeah, if you know him, he was my former basketball coach. So we go back a long ways, and his area of expertise is this idea of in Christ, Christ in us. And so I've been contending with this for a while. Uh, last week, I think I made a statement that I'll probably roll back a little bit. Um, how many of you know uh, I'm not perfect? I know, babe. No, no, you put your hand up way too quick on that. It's like. <laughs> and so in, in wrestling out issues, I try to get them right, and, and I don't always see it right, so I made the statement, kind of this idea. I was wrestling between Christ in us and us in Christ. And a lot of times we mesh them together. And so we were in Edmonton. We met, Brian and I met with Pastor Greg. And so I asked him his question. And an hour and a half later, we were sort of through some of it. 
And so we were contending back and forth with how to see it. And I said, listen, why don't you come in and minister on it? He's going to be here for something else. Minister on in Christ, your identity, our DNA in Christ, because he's got a lot of wisdom. He's got his doctorate in this kind of thing. And so I said, come on in and help me out. I'm willing to admit I might be seeing wrong, but I was challenging him. He was challenging me. But the main idea that we both came to is this kind of thing. And this is why I've been contending with it. Uh, at the conference that I was at, Chris Valentin said this, and it really stuck with me. He's like, we've sold people a costless gospel and so we have a powerless faith and the idea that stuck with me is this idea of a costless gospel I get it Jesus is the savior of the world right he's our savior but I think oftentimes what happens is even when we do this who wants to get saved Right? And people put up their hands and we say, hey, great, you're saved. And we treat salvation, although it is the most amazing, uh, life-altering, nature-changing event. We treat it as a one-time event, like you've got your ticket and now you're done. And there's nothing else about it. And so, it, 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 while I think salvation is an event, I also think salvation is a process of working out your salvation, Scripture talks about that. And so we both landed on this, and he'll talk about it, and, and you know, maybe sometime down the road I'll come back to what I was, was contending with, but it's this idea that uh, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, therefore we are the righteousness of God in Christ. When you get saved, or that process, you get placed in Christ. And I thought, what if instead of saying, hey, who wants to get saved, we started presenting altar calls to say, who wants to be in Christ? Because there's something different about this idea of being in Christ and then Christ in us, Christ being formed in us while we're in Christ because we, when we get saved, we all become brothers and sisters of Christ. Naturally, if you're trying to take a picture of it or what it would look like, we all become family because we all have the last name Christ. The anointed one and his anointing, you get that in your life and so it's Jesus Christ, Nicole Christ, Brad Christ, John Christ, Christ. Oh man, that's literally that guy's name. Who knows the comedian John Christ? Or, okay, nobody knows him. That joke would have worked a lot better if anyone knew him. Uh, Christ, and so we have the anointed one in his anointing in our lives. And so when we become in Christ, we get placed there as an event. We go, everything changes, but then we have to walk out a process. I'm going to read a verse that talks about maturing in Christ, developing in Christ. There's this process. There's something that's good. It's not a costless gospel. You've heard me talk about doing, and, and we just literally said hearing and doing. There's something about it. Take up your cross and follow me that Jesus says it's going to cost you everything. And it should. When we get placed in Christ, listen, I can't stay on this. Greg's going to minister on this. I, I may just skip right out of this because I, I've taken too much time. But when you get placed in Christ, right, your identity is completely in him. So it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how you feel you are. It doesn't matter what addiction you came in with. It doesn't matter because the moment you get placed in Christ, everything should be filtered out of that identification, And so we were just sitting there talking and trying to work. So I don't have a full handle on it. If you want to read Colossians 1, 27 to 29, just know there's some things you contend with. And I'm like, I'm trying to see this right. And so God puts people in your life. And so in two weeks, he's going to come and he's going to share. It. And it's going to be deep. He goes deep. You know, like he's very real, but it's very deep. And I love it because he challenges and he talks from such a personal experience and relational and stuff. And so I hope it... Uh, progresses us in this, but we want to build lives in Christ. Not just an event, but a process of realizing how do we live that out in our lives? How do we acknowledge what it means to walk in Christ, to work out our salvation, to do all those sorts of things? So we want to be able to do that. Because I know you can have the DNA and of Jesus on the inside of you. You can look like Jesus without looking like Jesus. My kids look like me, DNA-wise, but they may not look like me behavior-wise. So although we get placed in Christ, we can have him inside of us, and I believe we're made in God's image, there's prep processes and steps that we have to do and live in order to become like him. Okay. Whew. So we want to help people live their lives in Christ. So building lives together in Christ through our first one's compassion, 1211. Whew. Compassion. Matthew 9, 36. 
And when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 9, 14, 14. And he stepped ashore. This is Jesus they're talking, Matthew's talking about. He saw a huge crowd, felt compassion for them, and healed their sick. We won't be moved like Jesus was moved until we have compassion like Jesus had compassion. It was compassion that moved him. I'm saying this, this compassion is the why we do what we do. Compassion is the why we do what we do. How many of you know that you usually don't change for what, you change because of why? Somebody's like, I get it, let me give you an example. Someone has no one they've needed to change their eating habits, start working out, they'll be unnamed. We won't name this person Derek. That would be too obvious. But they've known they need to change some eating habits, start working out, you know, some health things as you get, how many of you know as you get older, some of those things, you know, that little chocolate bar sits with you a lot longer at 40 than it did 30 and even more at 50. And so God may be working with you. The what is still there. Yeah, it would be better to eat better. It would be better to take care of myself. It better, it better to be healthy. And so you struggle with that. And you have difficulty. Maybe you go to the doctor one day and he's doing some tests on you. You're going through your exam. And he goes, listen, we're taking a look at things around the heart. And if you don't change your eating and if you don't change some of your habits, you're going to have issues with your heart in a short amount of time. And all of a sudden you watch this person overnight Start eating better, quit smoking, quit drinking, quit doing stuff, stop having fast food, and you go, what changed? The what was always there, but the why changed. So why is important? It's the most important thing when you're trying to do something. When we're going out and reaching needs and we're trying to say, hey, this is what we're doing and we're doing this and we're doing doorstep, you have to always make sure your why is there and it's from the compassion of God in our hearts. So that we see people as God sees them. Jesus was moved with compassion. And uh, I'm not going to sit on this along because next week we're going to get into some values and I'm going to teach you all about compassion, not complacency. And there's a difference between compassion, sympathy, and empathy. And so I'm going to teach all about compassion from the prodigal son and how the father responded. And so we need to be moved with that. And so it's important. But City Center Church, we want to be a church full of compassion because then our why is in the right place so the rest of the stuff will follow suit. And so our prayer needs to be, God, move my heart with the things that move yours. All right, connection. Trying to move along here. (whistles) Compassion, connection. This is the what we do. Compassion was why we do it. Here's what we do. We want people to help get connected to Christ. Everything we do is for this purpose. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. Speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body fitted together, knit together, connected, connection, connection by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building of itself up in love by the proper working of each individual. Connection, connection, connection. Here's the point I want to make, and I'll try to get through some of this maybe a little faster. We are not just trying to build up conversions to Christ. We are trying to build up connections in Christ. We don't just want conversions to Christ. That's great, but we're trying to build connections in Christ. Building lives in Christ. We want people to connect with Jesus and be built into him. The conversions are up to God. The connections are up to you and I. I'm going to roll that back. Don't miss that. Now, God uses us, but it's God working in people's heart. The conversions are up to God. The connections are up to us. Now, sometimes conversions will lead to connections, but other times connections will lead to conversions. And how we love others, how we treat others. Do you know that there may be somebody who has a misrepresented view of God, the church, different things because of things they've gone through. And they stay away from church. They stay away from God. Maybe they don't even believe in God. And the only God that they may see that builds a connection to a conversion might be in how you deal with them, how you talk to them, how you love them, how you, you know, give to them, how you just do things differently, and they go, what is this all about? And it opens up the door because you connect with them, and then you can bring them to what in Christ means. They may be the only God that, you, that they see. You may be the only God that they see. Thank you. 
Roll that back. They may be the only God you see. They may not come into a church. They may be scared to. Something might have happened to them or their parents. And so they've got this distorted view of God. And you walk in under the anointing of the Spirit. And you start loving. You start caring. You start giving. You start showing compassion. And they go, what is this? And you say, this is God in me. And they see a different picture and it changes everything. Whoo. Connection. 1 John 4, 20 to 21. Now, I'm going to skip it, Alana. Let's go right to community. So we have compassion, connection, and community. So compassion is why we do. Connection is what we do. Community is the way we're going to do it. This is how it's done in community. Community is a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes interests and goals so now we have a goal we've done our vision statement we have a same vision we have a same goal guess what our common interest is jesus and then we're going to learn about our values and so that we have common attitudes or values and so that's what community is we want everyone to have a sense of belonging and fellowship around the cause of christ Hebrews 10, 24, let us be concerned about one another. This is community, if you were wondering what community means. Let us be concerned about one another to promote love and good works. This is a point. It's not going to come up on the screen. You can listen to it back or whatever. But here's number one. Community in Christ is a genuine concern for others demonstrated by love and good works. That's what community is. It's demonstrated to each other by love and good works. Love and good works. Love and good works. Love and good works. Community in Christ is a genuine concern for others demonstrated by love and good works. Galatians 6, 1 to 2. Brothers, if someone is caught in any wrongdoing, I'm going to preach out of this verse, not today fully, but this last line especially, sometime coming up probably in the new year because this verse is amazing. Brothers, if somebody is caught in any wrongdoing, out them, throw them under the bus, make sure you post it on social media for everyone to know. Because that's the way things get dealt with. No, look what it says. If somebody's caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, somebody was writing that down. Oh, is that what we have to do? (laughs) She's like, thought that was real. It says this, you who are spiritual. Do we have any spiritual people in this place today? Well, everyone's a spirit being, so (laughs) you're spiritual on some level. So everyone can put their hand up there. It may be another spirit, but that's, you know, that's a deliverance service later. You who are spiritual, watch this. You who are spiritual, what? Should restore such a person with a gentle spirit. Should what? Restore them. No, you should reject them. No, no, you should restore them. You should restore them, but you should do it with real anger and say, you stupid. Is that what that says? No, you should restore them with a gentle spirit. Watch, watch. Watching out for yourselves so you also won't be tempted. Basically, they're saying, watching out for yourselves because there's going to be a time you do something wrong and you're going to hope somebody restores you with gentleness like you did them. Come on. We're like, oh, I'm never, no, no, listen. There's going to be a time you're going to want somebody to show you mercy and show grace and restore you like that because there's going to be a time you mess up and if you judge that way, guess what's coming back to you? And then this, I love this. This is the part I really love. Carry one another's burdens this, in this way you will fulfill the call of Christ. Other translations just say this. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I'm going to just say this as an introduction for whenever I get to this. The problem is when people have burdens or when people are burdened down or have weaknesses or have sins or do wrongdoings, what we want to do in today's culture is we want to bury people instead of bear with people. Come on. We look to bury people instead of bearing the burdens. When they have burdens, we say, we want to bury you for that instead of saying, hey, how can I come help you bear that? That's just an intro for whenever I get to that. All right, here's number two. So doing about community. Community in the world is rejecting and burying one another. Community in Christ is restoring and bearing one another. Community in the world is rejecting and burying one another. Community in Christ is restoring and bearing one another. 
1 Corinthians 12, 26, this is number three, and we're getting close. I have less than a page, there you go. So that there would be, oh no, so if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice within it, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Community in Christ is suffering and celebrating with one another. When somebody suffers, guess what? You get with them, you suffer with them, you help them through it, you point them to Jesus. When people are rejoicing, when people are honoring, you honor them, you rejoice with them. Community in Christ is suffering and celebrating with one another. Why do we have community? 1 Corinthians 12, 25, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. There would be no division in the body. Listen, listen, listen. We're talking about divine DNA. There is nothing divine about division. Nothing divine about division. We could have divine DNA in here, but as soon as division comes, you just understand how a body works. Division doesn't work in a body. It just will not function. It's difficult to live out our divine DNA when we're not in unity. It's impossible to build community without unity. It's impossible to have community without unity because if you take away unity, all you have is come. Come unity? All you have is come. See, if you have no unity, all you have is come. We want to come to church on a Sunday, but if we don't have unity, we don't have caring for someone else on a Monday. We may come to church on a Sunday, but if there's no unity, we don't have helping someone move on a Saturday. We may have coming to church on a Sunday, but if there's no unity, we have gossip towards someone on a Wednesday. We may have coming to church on a Sunday, but if there's no unity, we have anger towards someone on a Friday. We have come, but we don't have unity, but we need to be able to be willing to come together in unity to form community. I thought that was good. We don't, it was an applause sometimes, right? Community. And listen, the devil wants to make you think you're alone and get you in isolation. Everything is better in community. Everything, you're isolated, you're alone, wants you to work in dark spaces, say it's never gonna, and make you feel like you're alone, nobody knows, you can't tell anyone what you're going through, you can't tell anyone what you're dealing with, no, everything is better in community. God designed us for community. Coming together in unity. And when we do this, building lives together in Christ through compassion, connection, community, notice CCC, Compassion, connection, community. When we do that, it's going to result in neighborhood transformation. What is your neighborhood? Who remembers ethnos and cosmos? Sphere of influence is ethnos, cosmos is different cultures, people that aren't the same as you, everywhere you can do it. Your neighborhood, listen, City Center Church, CC Church's neighborhood is the area in which God put our divine DNA in the middle of. That's our neighborhood that we're called to impact. Your neighborhood is where the area that God has put your divine DNA in the middle of. Woo! That's wherever God's put your divine DNA, that's your neighborhood. Wherever God's put your divine DNA to influence, your sphere of influence, that's your neighborhood. And so when we build lives together in Christ through compassion, you're going around making connections, building community, guess what? It transforms the areas around you. And how do you transform a neighborhood? By transforming the hearts in the neighborhood. Music team, come on up. You guys listened well. And so we want to transform some neighborhoods. We have been transformed. We're going to continue to transform this neighborhood for Christ, for Jesus. And in order to transform hearts, we want to be willing to build people up in Christ through compassion, connection, community. God is calling you to transform the heart of your neighborhood. God is calling us to transform the heart of our neighborhood. The mission statement is going to come up one more time. There it is. Building lives together in Christ through compassion, connection, community, resulting in neighborhood transformation. That's the mission. That's how we do what God's called us to do. Are you willing to do it, City Center Church family? Are we willing to take, uh, do what it takes to build lives in Christ, to move, move with compassion, to be like, hey, we need to build connections, to start building connections, to look for how we can build connections and bring people into the community so that we can bring about transformation in your neighborhood, in our neighborhood, and the neighborhoods in this city.
Who's ready to do that? Who's saying, I can do that? Come on, stand. Come on, stand with me. Couple questions and then we're done. First question is, I want you to ask yourself this week, who's my neighbor? Where's my sphere? Who's God calling me to do this to? For, towards. (laughs) Who's God wanting me to show compassion, start building connection, start creating community around them, show them the love of God, point to them, be Christ for them, help them be in Christ. Who's your neighbor? You want to ask yourself this week, who's my neighbor? You can all be Mr. Dress Up, is that right? Oh, Mr. Rogers. Not Mr. Dress Up. That's the guy in his tickle trunk. Casey and Finnegan. Oh, I got a joke. I should just stay on task. Okay, what is this? Close. What is this? Somebody said puppet. They're close. Finnegan naked. If you're younger, you'll have no idea what just happened there. Ask somebody who's older later. Some are older like, no, I didn't get it either. It's all right. That was a blast from the past. I I learned that one. And then Mr. Dr... Oh, boy. Help me, Jesus. Who is my neighbor, Mr. Rogers? Who's your neighbor, number two? Who is God calling me to transform the heart of? This is kind of a second one. Who's God calling me to transform the heart of? I missed an opportunity in Edmonton, I believe. I can confess. We were talking in the coffee shop and God said, go bless the the baristas that were working. Is that what they still call them? Baristas? And so I blessed them and I was supposed to pray with them and I kind of was figuring out and I just didn't. So, but... Who's God trying to go, go talk, change the heart of, impact them, love them, tell them I love them, I want to show them something. We got to be looking for that. And then number three, how can I demonstrate Christ better this week than I did last week? And on to that is always, the the, the sub to that that I don't think we should ever leave is, does it look like I've been with Jesus? Because if it looks like we've been with Jesus, then we'll demonstrate Christ better than we did the week before. And this is just by the Spirit I didn't have this in my notes. But in order to look like Jesus, you've got to learn to how to be with Jesus. So we get it through the word, but these times where you come in, that's why, again, praise and worship, don't come late. There's a time for us to figure out how Jesus is like, sing about him, get that revelation. And so you need to create times in your schedule where you can learn to be with Jesus. Let me tell you something, and then we're done. We'll pray for people. Whoever wants to pray, and we're out of here. My kids and I, And it's not my wife because she leaves earlier than us. But we've started reading the Bible every day on the Bible app. I've always struggled to get consistency in leading my family in family devotions. And I've always been bothered by it. Anybody can relate? It's like, oh, and we do some evenings and we get good. And then, okay, we'll do it three times a week. And then things would get busy. So now we have the practice starting this year. We get the version out and the Bible reading for the day. And it's been great because I don't have to generate content, which is sometimes difficult. And it's got a variety. And it is simple. It's 10, 12, 13 minutes. But I'm telling you, it's changing my life. I'm in the Word a lot. I'm in prayer a lot, but something about getting up in the morning and just setting, it doesn't have to be hours. It just has to be prioritized and disciplined. And I'm watching my kids. I was in Edmonton. I didn't know what would happen. And my wife sent me a picture on Friday morning without me. They're sitting around the table doing their devotions, taking turns on who's reading and doing stuff. And I texted her and I said, well, the real, the crux is going to be, do they still pray for people after? Because at the end, we always pray in tongues and we say, God, who are you wanting us to pray for? And sometimes it's some of you in this church and you know that's always a little bit more difficult but what happened is she texted me and she said yeah they on their own started praying for different people and different things and they did it Friday they did it Saturday and then today this morning we got up and we were doing it together we usually do it weekdays and you kind of do it on your own but they were doing it and it blessed my heart and it was what we're saying it's finding ways to say I'm going to get with Jesus so I begin to look like I've been with Jesus and so I encourage you, if you don't have you version, get you version. It's easy. Get someone to show you. Many people have it. They have a daily Bible reading. It's not, you don't, you can do it at whatever level of prayer you want, but it will help you get consistent in it. And it doesn't have to be massive. It doesn't have to be complex. Just get disciplined in it and it will start to change your life. 
And for the first time, I'm excited. I'm like, oh, our family's doing stuff. We see God moving, and I'm leading in that direction. It makes me happy. And I'm also so excited that my kids are picking it up and starting to put it in practice in your life. And so we can do this together. And as we do that, the word gets in us, and we go become more like Jesus. We come and affect our neighbors and look at our neighbors, and God starts just flowing out of us. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for what you've done today already with your worship, that we can come before you and you just always meet us here. We're so honored and grateful that you grace us with your presence, even that you just call us yours. Sometimes, God, I don't know how you just put up with us. It must just be frustrating how you put up with me, God, but I'm so grateful for your never-ending mercy and what you've done that God as you set the vision of the church and we're communicating and now the mission of how to do it and as we go next week into the values and the attitudes the things we want to look like and talk like and stuff that you help us all take this on so that when people come in it looks like you Jesus thank you for people this week that whatever they're doing God they're doing it in Christ they're doing it empowered by you that you help people to find moments to encounter you to be with you so they become uh, they, they look like they've been with you Father God and that we start looking around to go God who do you want us to impact who's our neighbor how do we want to be Jesus to these people Father God that we start doing this and get boldness to just step into that and we watch people's lives be touched and transformed with your power in Jesus name Amen, Amen. alright